Hey folks, uh, good morning everyone. Thanks for joining another session of Azure Power Lunch. Uh, today we have Bresh Sharda, who's gonna be presenting on uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. Bresh, please go ahead, floor is yours, man. Thank you, Navid. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. I uh, hope I'm loud and clear. Uh, if not, I'll try to shout as much as I can. Uh, again, welcome, and this, it's been privileged. I presented Windows Virtual Desktop somewhere around, uh, I guess, March, when it was just about to public preview. And today I'm presenting it, but just after a few weeks, it has become a GA. So I think it, it's a good continuity for me as well. And it's also a good uh, verification from your side that, yeah, this guy told us all of this thing, whether that's working or not, now it's in GA, you can verify those stuff for me, okay? So that's it. Uh, starting, considering we have only 30 minutes, I uh, want to make sure that we cover some of the basics first. Okay, who am I? I'm Paresh Sharda. Um, I'm a CSA with specifically around Azure Apps and Infra. Before this, I was with Harman on the IoT side um, and more of a business modeling side. And then before that, I was with TCS as an assistant consultant. Uh, what are we going to cover today? A few service updates, um, and then we'll deep dive into Windows Virtual Desktop. And then I'm be happy to answer any Q&A around Windows Virtual Desktop or in general anything around Azure. With that, let's jump to Azure service updates. And as you might know, there are quite a lot. So this is one thing I like to do with uh, whoever I talk about Azure updates. It's it's really very difficult for anybody at Microsoft to give you an update about what's happening in Azure because we ourselves have a hard time catching up. What you saw right now scrolling up was all the updates we have released till August. I've not even included September and October so far. To give you a scale of the updates, here's what is here. Since 2014, you could see how we are growing. And with 691 updates till August, it's very difficult even for a weekly call, 30 minute call to just give you and talk about all the updates which are happening in Azure. Hence, anybody who is interested in Azure or in general cloud, I recommend to go ahead and leverage some of the resources which are out there. If you want to go a broad based information, kind of broadcast kind of information, the two places where you should be able to get updates is Azure updates. Uh, you can subscribe to RSS feeds. You can uh, filter out based on your interest areas, whether you are a data scientist or a business analyst or a data analyst, or you are into networking, you can filter out a lot of those things, right? So you can do it or you're just focused on a specific region because yeah, we will send you out updates and we have, you anyways are might be getting a lot of emails from Microsoft. You don't want more, one more, right? So it's better you go ahead and subscribe. It's better you go ahead and Hello? Okay, I think it, somebody just joined with unmuted Mac, so that's fine, yeah. So yeah, so go ahead and view your products by your regions. You will be able to see which product is in GA, which is in private preview, public preview, or uh, what's the roadmap around that. So you will be able to go ahead and see that. That's more of the, at a higher level on the inform part of it. If you are already using Azure and already looking, uh, working on it, I highly recommend to start looking into uh, some of the contextual pieces of information, which are uh, not, sorry, I am connected to my phone and I don't know how I can take off. <laughs> this notification, although I put up do not disturb mode. I don't know why. OK, so one is on the Azure advisor, which gives you uh, advice around multiple areas of Azure, including cost, security, performance, availability, right? Uh, if you are worried about your cost and want to manage it, your cost management is an excellent feature where you can track what is happening, what's consuming more, what are your avenues for cost saving? And Azure Security Center, as the name suggests, will give you security recommendations around best practices. The, uh, the, there's, the first two are pretty much entirely free for you. The second one has a free and a standard tier, uh, but free tier is good for, at least from an assessment perspective. Like you can at least see the assessment, see your current status, uh, and look into the policies around those. So I would highly recommend to do that one. And the last one is very critical where you, if you have any workloads running in Azure and you are worried about whether they are up or not, uh, you should need to be alerted if there is any um, kind of an outage around um, our Azure environment, whether whichever region is, you should get subscribed to Azure Service Health and your service emails. This will allow you to subscribe to alerts 
specific to your subscription, specific to your resources. So this is very good way of like getting known rather than waiting for your end users and telling and complaining you that, oh, my app is not working or it's not reachable. Uh, this is much faster way. The other thing is once you're subscribed to that, you will also get RCAs for if there has been an issue in an environment and we do an RCA, we'll publish out those results and those information will be also sent out to you. So that way uh, it, it includes some of those recommendations that what we as Microsoft are doing to 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 not repeat that and even do it much better, but also there would be recommendations and advice for our customers to go ahead and uh, uh, go ahead and uh, basically uh, make sure that the same outage doesn't happen again. Here are some of the resources for whatever sessions you are going to cover, so I believe this would be available to you as well. Jumping into today's topic, Windows Virtual Desktop. What it is, it's simply the best virtual desktop experience delivered on Azure. That's it. Uh, that's a symbol. We all have dealt with virtual desktops in one form or the other form in our career lives. Pretty much anybody who's joining new or who has experience have seen different form of uh, virtual, rest or virtual desktops, right? And uh, here are some of the scenarios. I'll not go into the details of the scenarios because pretty much everybody has their own scenario and uh, they know when, when VDI makes uh, sense. But in case there is something you do let us know, we, we can help you justify whether VDI would be a uh, kind of a justifiable solution for such and specific scenarios. What is happening today without Windows Virtual Desktop on Azure was, uh, yes, you might be using Citrix, your VMware Horizon, or any other third party solution. But typically, if, if it is a Windows environment, there are two, two, two uh, baseline, if I have to say, categories of VDIs. One is on the server side of the house where you are actually providing a desktop experience using the RDS capabilities on Windows Server. But this is more for legacy Windows environment. You won't get the modern Windows 10 experience like with Cortana or, or even Windows Store and all those capabilities, right? So those won't be available, but it's still working. It still works and many organizations are already leveraging it. Uh, it has a very long-term servicing channel also. While Windows 10 Enterprise also provides VDI capabilities, but that's only for a single user or single session mode. Like you cannot have more than one session on a Windows 10 if you're using it for VDI. Uh, this does provide modern Windows experience and it has integrated Office 365 Pro Plus and the, uh, the release channel is quite, quite um, uh, aggressive in this one as compared to the Windows Server experience. What then changes when it comes to WVD uh, on Azure. One is, yes, you can continue to have Windows Server RD session host because if your applications are legacy, they require that legacy environment, you can continue using Windows Server to host your remote desktop sessions. On top of that, what is new and what is unique about WVD on Azure is a Windows 10 Enterprise multi-session. And why that would be very critical is obviously you can have a single host hosting multiple sessions of Windows 10. So that gives you a better density, better, better I'll say cost uh, performance for your host sessions. You don't need to spin up multiple VMs because that single VM can host multiple users and not necessarily every user is a kind of gonna use the 100% of the resources. So you can always share those resources and get a better value out of your money spent on those hosts, right? And this is only available in Azure. You cannot kind of have those multi sessions right now on prem, uh, even if you are a Windows 10 Enterprise customer. Uh, this specific SKU of Windows 10 is only available within Azure. And the other part is this specific SKU has also been optimized for Office 365 Pro Plus. And we'll go into the details of uh, the FX logics and our acquisition of uh, that last year and how that, that enables uh, the efficiency around Office 365 and user profiles. And the next is for your power users who still need a dedicated kind of a uh, host, or dedicated VMs, uh, you will be able to go ahead and uh, uh, do that as well. So you can use multi-session as well as you can have dedicated host also. I'll be going a bit fast. I have a lot of content to cover. So if you feel it's too fast, I need to slow down. Or if you have questions, please, please unmute yourself. Um, at a high level, what are the benefits of Windows Virtual Desktop? Yes. It enables multi-session Windows 10 experience, optifies for Office 365 4 Plus, supports Windows Server 2012 R2 Plus and above. Uh, it has the most flexible service, allowing you to virtualize both desktops and apps. So this is very important. Like 
uh, yes, you can create a, a virtual desktops, but also you can create like session host, which are for your virtual apps. So that you don't you don't need kind of a full fledged VM just to run a single app, and you can actually virtualize your app, and your user doesn't need to log into a desktop and then use an app. They can just directly use the app as is, uh, as if it is natively installed on their client. And I'll, I'll show you in the demo as well very quickly. Uh, another major one, Windows 7. Yes, I know we have still many many enterprises and customers on Windows 7 for multiple reasons, and that could be. Uh, dependency, application dependencies, because new old applications which are very critical for their business just doesn't run, run on Windows 10 or the vendor is not ready to support on Windows 10. So those kind of scenarios where you still need Windows 7, uh, right now your option is to purchase those security updates uh, at an additional cost, which can add uh, again add up to your overall operational cost. If, if, if that is a scenario and if you are worried about that, you could actually go ahead and leverage Windows 7 virtual desktop on Azure and get those three years of free extended uh, security updates. So that's another compelling reason why you might want to consider Windows Virtual Desktop. And again, integrated security and management for Office 365. This, this goes along with any Azure service. So basically the security, the monitoring, the log, uh, logging capabilities, uh, integration with Azure Active Directory, multi-factor authentication, conditional based access, pretty much all those uh, good security um, services uh, and monitoring services are integrated with Windows Virtual Desktop. So you don't need to kind of focus, spin up any additional tool or any additional workload just to enable the, that level of security or that level of monitoring. Uh, what are the current supported OS uh, which you can leverage in Windows Virtual Desktop? Yes, Windows 10 multi uh, session as well as single session. Windows 7 single session, 2019, 2016, and 2012 R2 Windows servers. Okay, all of these VMs run in customers as your subscription so they have full control over them if you want to put up gpo policies if you want to put your own client and um, uh, client uh, monitoring endpoint protection tooling you can do that you want to create your own master golden image and put your corporate controls into that you can go ahead and do that uh, it is just as an extension of your data center as an is uh, within your azure subscription so your network control uh, everything would be there, uh, out there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what the do not disturb means <laughs> with the notification. I'll have to tell that out. Maybe I don't know how to use it. Uh, here's a timeline of what has happened with Windows Virtual Desktop. I think this is one of the most awaited and talked about service I have seen recently with Azure. Like even with private preview, there was a lot of noise, a lot of interest with customers, a lot of customers got into the private preview part of it. When it became in public preview in March, I had a lot of customers waiting for those sessions and they started using it out. And right now it's in GA. GA has been in only few, uh, few services. Uh, down the line, uh, we will have uh, the service available in multiple regions and then uh, within US and then down the line across the globe. And then to our uh, specific uh, special uh, tenants uh, around US Go and just a sec, I'm just clearing out all my notifications so that they, they don't bother us. Let's look at a, what the deployment looks like and what are the requirements for the deployment. Yes, you'll need Azure subscription. That's the first thing. You'll definitely need an Azure Active Directory because you have a subscription, you have directory there as well, right? Next is you have to determine your Active Directory strategy, how you are going to domain join those virtual host and authenticate your end users. You have two options. You can use the standard Active Directory, whether it could be on-premise or within Azure, or you can use uh, Azure Active Directory domain services, ADTS. And I'll, have, I'll, I'll explain that what are the differences, pros and cons of each of those approaches. Uh, what else you'll require? You'll require all the associated Azure resources in basically your OS disk image, your virtual network, storage, region, where you are going to deploy your virtual host, uh, or the, the host pool, all of that. And then you will require some additional credentials, specifically around Azure AD. You need to have access to the, or you or your global administrator must should be able to provide you that necessary access, right? Uh, whether you want to get a touch, and then create a role or whether you want to create uh, uh, a service principle for, for, for the service, 
So all of those things uh, will be required. What are the credentials which are going to require? As I said, either your Azure AD Global Admin should be uh, on board, uh, or you have enough permissions on the Azure Active Directory to create service principles, to create, uh, um, to update your role as a tenant creator. Uh, so that is what's going to require at the Azure subscription level. On the client side, you have options uh, of multiple options around uh, uh, HTML5 client, uh, OS, uh, uh, Android, or uh, iOS uh, mobile clients, as well as Windows 10 uh, client also. This part is what is the managed WVD service. This is the service which is managed by Microsoft for you. You don't need to get into the details of it. Basically, you don't even have access to the internal workings of it. Yes, you will have access to the diagnostics and logs, but beyond that, this is a managed service managed by Microsoft. And this is your Azure subscription where you will have your networks, your, your own Active Directory, and if you're using FS logics for either uh, user profile containers or Office 365 containers, uh, then you will require a file server, uh, a traditional file server or an Azure file. Server. We'll look into that. Wow. All right. You know what? I think it's a good idea to close Outlook itself. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, thinking about network requirements before you start with any WED uh, considerations, you can need to lay. You need access to Active Directory. Now that Active Directory can be on-prem, can be within your Azure subscription, or you can leverage the service which we have Azure Active Directory domain services. Okay, uh, and then that Active Directory should also sync with your Azure AD, your tenants Azure AD, so that the users you provision uh, have access to the uh, WVD service. Uh, and the VMs which are gonna be part of your host pool needs to be domain joined to the same AD which has been synced to your Azure AD. So these are the basic three requirements from an Azure AD side of it. Uh, now from a networking perspective, if you have Express Route and you have a kind of an active directory which is hosted on-prem and it is reachable from your uh, Azure networks, uh, well and good, you might not need an active directory put up in Azure. Uh, it depends on your express or bandwidth location of your um, WD host pool, uh, but many times we have seen that this might add additional hops and uh, kind of latency for the initial authentication. So most of the customers do at least have kind of a replicated Active Directory in Azure uh, to lower the latency there. Site-to-site uh, -site VPN again can work, but Again, the same applies for um, Express Route. Uh, I've seen customers either putting a read-only Active Directory, which is replicated in Azure uh, for, for those initial authentication. And then if you are using Azure AD domain services, you don't really need an on-prem connectivity. Basically, everything is within Azure Active Directory, and then there's a managed Active Directory within your virtual network, which will be used for uh, for domain joining and for, for all the other purposes, uh, the AD is required for WD service. Uh, so what you could do, as I again said, you have multiple options, spin up a DC in your Azure subscription. Many customers try to do that because again, it makes sense uh, from a latency and they have other workloads running in Azure, which also relies on that uh, Active Directory. Uh, so it can sync with on-prem DC. Uh, it's all familiar. You're, it's, still GPO policies and everything is all available to you. So that's pretty so solid there. What's the con about it? Yeah, there's another VM, another Active Directory VM, which needs to be managed in Azure. But if you have other workloads, which are anyways gonna leverage that, probably uh, there's no, I'll not see this as a real con, but it's just that you have to keep in mind that there's an, another VM running your Active Directory in Azure. Uh, you could use cloud-based organization. So basically, organization doesn't have an on-prem Active Directory and they are pretty much everything is in cloud. They could leverage uh, Azure AD domain service, the ADDS, and it's good. Basically, you are not managing your domain service. You don't have all the good stuff of traditional on-prem AD. There are few limitations around group policies. There are a few limitations around trust setups and certificate setups when it comes to ADDS. I'll not go into details of those, but there are a few limitations there. But for WED service perspective, it's rock solid. You can leverage that. 
Um, what's the con of it? Yes, although it's managed service, it adds additional fixed charge for that domain service to be run. So that is on top of your Windows Virtual Desktop core. Next is uh, for your hybrid uh, organization where you have VPN and you can you can kind of go ahead and uh, uh, you can go ahead and uh, basically connect to an on-prem one, but latency should be considered. Anything above 150 milliseconds, just don't use it. I'll say anything under 100 milliseconds is recommended. If it goes above 100 milliseconds, just don't use that AD. Otherwise, there would be a lot of kind of uh, the, you, the end user experience might not be that great. So uh, visualizing what I just told in the previous two slides, how you can set up. So if you are using Azure AD domain service, you will have Azure Active Directory. You will have your network where your host pool are going to reside. And then you can go ahead and kind of set up Azure AD domain service. And this domain service is going to spin up a kind of a Active Directory or a domain controller within your virtual network. And it would be managed by Microsoft. So updates, availability, everything would be managed by Microsoft. So you don't need to worry about the domain service or the domain controller. But yeah, there is an added cost for that. And if you are using your on-prem Active Directory, it needs to be synced to Azure Active Directory. You can also do an AD uh, replication and have an kind of a, another rep replica of your Active Directory in Azure also for domain joining, or you can domain join over Express Route or uh, VPN. Okay. How you can create a tenant? Uh, so right now, although the services is in GA, uh, the the typical uh, I'll say experience you get with any other Azure services like yeah, you can do it with portal, you can do it with CLI, you can do it with uh, PowerShell or ARM scripts. Uh, Windows Virtual Desktop still still is going to kind of bring them all together. Right now, not everything is not in place, but that doesn't stop you to use this service and that doesn't degrade any SLA commitment Microsoft has for this service. It's in GA, it, it goes by CLS, SLS, which we have published. But basically, what happens is you go ahead, first grant the Azure AD consent. So the, uh, this consent is basically telling that you allow Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop Service to access to the Azure AD tenant so that we can have like have a look at who the users are, who has access to it, what level of access the, he or she has, right? So that's the first thing step to do. Next is you decide who will be you creating the tenant for you. So if there's a tenant creator role, so you have to go ahead within your Active Directory your, or your global admin of Azure Active Directory can go ahead and assign the user a tenant creator role. And then you can go ahead and create your tenant. The creation of tenant currently is through PowerShell or basically through, through command line only, uh, Azure CLI or PowerShell. Uh, it's not through portal as of now. Down the line, we are expecting that to also come out through portal. Once your tenant is created, you go ahead and provision your host, uh, uh, publish remote apps, do all, that, all, all of that stuff. So next is where you can go ahead and create a host pool and you can update your existing VMs. And then you can also have, we have a lot of uh, content published on GitHub as a lot of scripts to set up your scaling, how you want to scale, whether you want to scale horizontally or like you want to go in the depth mode or a, or a breath mode, uh, you can go ahead and decide all of those stuff. Before jumping to FS logics, I'll just give very briefly how how the the look and feel of it is. And uh, what you need to do is download a Windows a remote desktop client. There's a unique desktop client which needs to be downloaded. And once you download it, you will have to actually go ahead and uh, basically log in. Uh, with your credentials, whatever your Azure Active Directory credentials are, which are tied to your Windows Virtual Desktop tenant, you have to log in using those. So based on your roles and users, whatever have been available to you by your uh, tenant admin, you will be able to see. So for example, right now I can see I have eight apps and one desktop published to me. You could see I am a different user. I'm not Paresh Sharda here because this is a demo tenant. It's a different uh, different uh, Azure tenant altogether. It's not corporate Microsoft tenant. Hence, you see this difference. But once I've logged in, basically it, it validates and it, it, it registers my machine or my client and it makes me available all of this. Uh, just a sec, I'll delete it so that we can see the tenant and the client. So what happens 
is if I open one of this app, this is actually opening a remote app. You can see the details if if, if it allows me. Yeah. Uh, it is actually making a remote session call to the WVD service. And uh, if I can go back to the screen, yeah, here's the Excel. So this Excel, although it looks and feel as if it's my on native Excel installed on my machine, it is a kind of a remote app being streamed to my machine. So as far as fidelity is concerned, uh, you can use pretty much whatever you are using the normal day to day Excel. You could go ahead and use it. You can save it back. You have an option to save it back into the machine itself. And if you have FX logic uh, configured, it will go into your own documents and your own profile container. Or if I, let's say I do this PC here, this is my, my virtual PC there. It's my VDI. It's not my local machine. My local machines or my local laptop, which I'm currently using as a client, the hard drives of those are published like this. So you could see C and D drive. These are my local machines drive. While this is this C drive or this D drive is actually from my the host drives which are available to that. But if I go ahead and save it in my documents, this is going to store it in the profile container, user profile container for me. So whenever I log in next time, and chances are I might not land up in the same host, my profile and containers and my content will still be available so that I don't need to be assigned or tagged to a specific machine. Uh, I can be roaming anywhere. I can join from my uh, my my client here uh, as in my Windows client, or I can join in, for example, this is my mobile client on my Android machine, on my, my Samsung uh, device. So I can, as you could see, I can log in and do a full fledged desktop. I don't know whether it will make sense without uh, uh, the DAX, uh, but it's very un unusable to do a remote desktop on a mobile phone. Or I can just go ahead and open up the same Excel. So if I open up the Excel, it's actually making a connection to the WVD gateway. It's initiating a remote connection and I'll be able to see the same Excel running and opening out on my fo mobile phone. So I've seen customers specifically in manufacturing and in in few other uh, areas where they have a lot of legacy apps uh, and then they had this their end users like just to update one simple parameter of a process of a manufacturing process. They had to actually go ahead and uh, run to a terminal just to update something. Uh, with this, I am working with at least three other customers in the manufacturing space where they are actually publishing their legacy apps and then making them available on their phones uh, on the manufacturing floor. And they are actually updating those those stuff directly over the phone, which is really a save, time saver for them. So you could see the same session which I had running earlier on my desktop X, uh, client. Uh, I just connect back to the same same uh, session. It, I don't lose. Uh, stuff which uh, which I have already done, right? Fresh, we have uh, not almost yeah. on time. Yes, yes, that's what I need to know. That just, just one second, I want to cover one yeah, super please, piece of please. technology is FS Logics, and this is an acquisition we did in November 2018, I believe, if my timing is correct, and we have integrated that technology into that. And if you are entitled to use that, and there are some licensing requirement around uh, leveraging FS logics, which I'm not going in details right now, but three pieces of critical technology which that brings up. One is profile container. So this is basically user profile container where you don't need to worry about those roaming profiles and folder redirection. Uh, basically, from an end user perspective, it is completely transparent to them. They, if they store their data in my documents and basically the user's own profile, it will be kind of available to them whenever they join back the session. Whichever host they land up, whether it is just a remote app or whether it is a full-fledged desktop, their profile will be attached to that. Uh, so this, this helps a lot. Uh, basically, it leverages container technology as well as Azure files and file shares, uh, basically. Uh, where whenever a user logs in, we just attest an entire profile of that into the session. It also includes Office 365 containers, which helps you kind of so that your cache of your Office 365 services like OneDrive and all of those are also moving along with your session. 
so that uh, you don't have to kind of wait will to start an outlook and let's wait for the outlook to download all the messages and into your PST file. It would be available right out of the box as soon as you open outlook. Uh, another is app masking. Uh, this is where you can have like you <clears throat> the way you have like golden image for your entire desktop. You could also have like golden images for your apps and host it separately. So so when a user is trying to open an app and if you have multiple users trying to open it up, you don't need to install that app again and again on each of the host. You can leverage app masking so that the same app is delivered through the same through a shared image and shared host. This 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 makes it excellent way of kind of uh, getting a better density also as well as um, kind of making sure that all of the apps and versioning and everything is kind of consistent across all users and you don't need the lot of rework which is required an app installing on each of the image and each of the host you can reduce a lot of work around that as well and then the java redirection piece is around the vulnerability for multiple version of it how how you want to redirect your users or java related stuff a request to a specific version for an individual app or a website so these are three critical pieces I'll not go into the details of all these slides. I hope those will be available to you down the line. Uh, I'll stop talking now. I know we are three minutes up, but I'm I can be back here for another four or five minutes if you guys want to have a conversation around that. Parish, uh, will the, will you be able to uh, share the slide deck or yes. kind of? Yes, uh, PDF. This is this is uh, customer ready, so yeah. It's oh, public. perfect, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, man. Well, that's very Thank useful. You. Yeah. Any questions, folks? Please unmute yourself if you have any. Okay. How? Go ahead. How's the pricing handled for it? Yeah. So, if you are already a uh, M365 customer, E3 and above. I'll not go in details of licensing. Licensing is, uh, let me in, in fact go ahead and open up the page and share that. You are already licensed. You don't need additional license to use Windows Virtual Desktop. Basically, uh, let me open up the licensing slide for that uh, and then share it. The cost of the service, which will require basically the host pool which will be hosted in your Azure subscription. So however big your host pool is or how many host pools you have, you will have the standard Azure infrastructure cost of like compute storage, networking, all of that. From a licensing perspective to leverage Windows Virtual Desktop service, um, I'll open up uh, and share my screen again. And, and it's uh, publicly available. So. If you are already owning any of these licenses, you can leverage Windows 10 and Windows 7 uh, to for Windows Virtual Desktop service. You don't have to pay any additional cost for leveraging the WVD service. This service is included as part of these licenses. All right. If you want to use Windows Server, then you need SA basically or RDSCAL license with Active SA for any server above 2012 and R2 and above. If you want to use the server part of it, so both of the these are the licensing requirement to use the WVD service. If you own any of these licenses, there is no additional cost for using the service. The cost will be only for the host pools, which would be hosted in your Azure desktop or uh, Azure subscription, right? So that will be based on how big your host pools are, what VM SKUs you are using, what's your concurrency of users, and overall scope and scale of your our uh, VDI users, so that's your typical Azure cost. Hope this helps. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Is there an opportunity to use Resolve Instance in this case? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Uh, think of Ahab, think of Reserve Instance, uh, because for for from an Azure perspective, those are just traditional VMs. There's, there's no special WVD VM like that. It's just traditional VM. So Ahab and uh, uh, Reserve Instance, you can use both those pricing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions?
Thanks, Prash. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. You guys have a great weekend. Hope Thank you, helpful. folks. This is really helpful. Uh, see everyone uh, next week. Bye-bye. Great weekend. Bye-bye.